I'm just so admiring the way David's bras are fitting. Um, I've worn a 36B ever since I reached puberty. I'm now 66 this year. And I went with my sister-in-law in Cochrane to a lingerie shop yesterday where the woman comes in and looks at you. I found it really exposing and I felt very vulnerable. But anyway, it turns out I'm a 34C. And sometimes D. It, it made me feel better, you know, that my back was skinnier and my breasts were more bountiful than what I'd always thought they were. But David, obviously, someone has taken him up for a, a bra fitting at some time because he wears them very well, doesn't he? I want a poet who goes outside, who knows the small mechanics of the clothespin and the muddy boot. I was born in Saskatchewan, and Calgary was a city where we thought we would go to to have fun. Every kid from Swift Current went to, to Calgary to party when they graduated from grade 12, and, and I can see why tonight. It's still the party place, and the arts place, and the poetry place, and I'm very honored to be here, and thank you, Sherry D, for making this kind of thing happen for all of us. Prairies are still the place I belong, even though there's now a magnolia and a cherry tree blooming in my front yard. I felt so great here seeing the sky and the yellow grass and the sunshine. The new day. Across the eastern farmland and into the city, light spills unimpeded. Now, you can go into the dark that lives inside you. Even flies have a mother, a hard-won grief. Someone has taught them to wash and wash their faces until they shine. I'm going to read a few poems, not one long one, so if you want to save your applause till the end, that's fine with me. Otherwise, I'll wonder why you're clapping for one and not the other. And, and the, poem, the poem will feel hurt, you know? Uh, maybe I'll go from, uh, as a tribute to Kat and her impella. I'll move to Moose. And in particular, the moose knows. It's the most orbicular, the biggest nose of our country's ungulates, mimicking as much as anything a crook-necked squash, the one that won the ribbon at the country fair. The moose is so powerful, his singular is plural, yet when you come upon him at the edge of the forest, his nose relaxes you, it makes you laugh. It's as if the craftsman assigned to the task had never made a nose before, as if the moose was his first try, and after that, he was demoted to construct the scrotum of the sea lion, the toenail on the homo sapiens big toe. It's so risible, so homely, we call the biggest, thickest, tight end on the football team Moose. Though in truth, he studies poetry at NYU, and John Ashbery chose him as his only undergrad. If you're still chuckling, schnozzle, conk, bulbous, baboon, take another look at the beast you've come upon, who is looking at you, who is thinking. A great tree grows out of his head, a tree where no birds nest, and the wind, though it can smash a granary into the ground and levitate a tractor from field to field, can't budge the branches. Moreover, the tree is rooted in the moose's mind, 
a northern mind, a swamp mind, a mind of huge imaginings, so complex. Samuel Beckett and Virginia Woolf wait in line at dusk for his office hours so they can have a chat. My last erotic poem. <laughs> Who wants to hear about two old farts getting it on in the back seat of the Buick, in the garden shed among vermiculite, in the kitchen where we should be drinking Ovaltine and saying <laughs> no? Who wants to hear about 26 years of screwing, our once not unattractive flesh, now loose as unbaked pizza dough, <laughs> hanging between two hands before it's tossed? Who wants to hear about two old lovers slapping together like water hitting mud? <laughs> Hair where there shouldn't be, and little where there should. My bunion foot sliding up your bony calf. Your calloused hands sinking in the quick side of my belly. Our faithless bums crepey, collapsed. We have to wear our glasses to see down there. When you whisper what you want, I can't hear. <laughs> but do it anyway. And somehow get it right. Face it, some nights we'd rather eat a Hagen Doss ice cream bar or watch a movie starring Nick Nolte, who looks worse than us. <laughs> some nights we'd rather stroke the cats. Who wants to know, when we get it going, we're revved up. Like the first time, honest, like the first time. If only we could remember it. <laughs> Our old bodies doing what you know bodies do. Worn and beautiful and shameless. Yeah. The world is full of magnificent things that we don't think about very often. I began to get fascinated by them. Uh, Yogi Berra has a line, you can observe a lot just by watching. And that's kind of the theme of this book, and I'll just read a couple of pieces from it. They're mainly about commonplace, everyday objects, and then I also looked at body parts. Bobby pins. The man who invented them adored his mother and later his wife. The proof is in the hours he devoted to preventing the hairpin from scratching the scalp. After many experiments with the family St. Bernard, he came up with plastic polyps the size of the head of an ant to cover the tips. Rub your finger over them to see how finely they fulfill their purpose. What ingenuity, what premeditated care. He'd be the first to admit bobby pins are dull and unattractive. Still, he had an eye for beauty. Look at what they do. Expose a woman's neck. Modestly reveal the delectable world of an ear. They're responsible for that intimate command, let down your hair. After, at least one of them goes missing. When it's found days later under the bed or inside the pillow slip, it carries love's rusted luster, that small ache. Yeah. Feet. 
feet. Oh, feet. Nethermost to Luric twins, they are closest to the earth in all their doings. We go where they take us. Naked, they walked us from the sea, our spine straightening, our gills slamming shut, the salt on our skin crusting in the dry air, our hands astonished into being hands and not another pair of feet. Simplest of mechanisms, yet they contain enough bones to construct the skeleton of a small lizard with some left over in the Make a Reptile kit. <laughs> when exposed, feet are more vulnerable than any other private part, more tender. If you fall for your beloved's feet, you'll never leave, though the arches will collapse, the bunions bulge and callous. The feet say more about the ungainly state of the heart than the mouth does, than the hands. To suck a big toe is the first and last infinitive in the body sutra of pleasures. Hoarfrost <laughs> on the telephone wires. It's the old ones talking. Snow. How much snow and grief have in common? Their connection with the seasons, their silence, their slow accumulation. Consider the woman who, sensing the hush of the first snowfall, gets out of bed in the early light of morning and lifts a man's loafers from the back of the closet pulls on her boots and parka, and goes outside. Placing her hands inside his shoes, she bends, plants his footprints next to her own, straightens, takes another step, and does the same thing again and again, all the way from the porch to the garden gate. There, she stops and looks back, his tracks beside hers. She has matched the drag of one heel and the longer stride. The snow briefly holds them, then impeccably falling, it fills them in. I'll conclude with two new ones. Once there was a singing. A blackbird spit into her mouth. That's what started the singing, though she couldn't sing before. She was the one, not Orpheus, the animals walked into the sun to listen to. The voice Ulysses made so much of, the crew strapping him to the mast. You've heard all this before. Now the animals, half starved, skin quivering, won't leave their lairs. The cities close in on them, devour the meadows, the groves, the marshes. Trees turn into ghosts and won't grow leaves. The new Ulysses is the coxswain on the rowing team. His shouts echo and re-echo across the lake where children splash behind the ropes. Their mothers stand like bitterns in the water, necks stretched, eyes dark and glazed. Urk, urk, urk is what they hear when she starts singing. After. You've heard all this before. You're undismayed. Her mouth falls open and she drools. Late dialogue. If, he says. If what, she asks. If fish, if death, whose? She asks, 
if bird, if rain, if fire, where? If you, if me, if Tuesday, if Tuesday? If fist, he says, if meat, if blunt, if shovel, if wasp, if want, if want, if want. She takes off his glasses, kisses his high forehead, dips her finger in brandy and runs it along his lower lip. If yes, she says, if do. Thank you very much. Woo!